Well, welcome everyone to this uh, digital workshop for Transcribus to just get started. I'm gonna, uh, gonna help you get the hang of the basics of Transcribus. And um, I will be getting some help from Joanna Walker, who is from the Read Co-op team. And she will be keeping an eye out on the chat as well. Um, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chats too, uh, where possible. But my main focus will be on explaining you the basics. So keep your questions uh, as much as possible uh, limited to the right section. You will see what I mean with that in a minute. And also, um, don't jump ahead with your questions. Um, try to limit them to each section. Afterwards, we will have plenty of time to go into questions as well. Um, but I'm quite sure I have covered uh, nearly all the basics. So um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, double check. Yes, it's being recorded. Um, I will be making all of the slides available through Zenodo. Um, ask your questions in the, in the chat box. You probably have already found it. Um, I've muted you all. So if you're wondering why you can't unmute yourself, that's because I have been pushing some buttons. And um, you will be seeing some sort of timeline on the left side of your screen when I'm showing you the slides uh, uh, in a few minutes. Um, if there is any interest in a more advanced workshop in which I will be dealing with more advanced layout analysis, text to image, these kind of things. I can schedule that somewhere in May or June. Um, so I will be sending you a survey afterwards and after that I will discard all of your email addresses. Um, uh, but if you are interested, do let me know in the survey afterwards. So, um, just for practical reasons, I start with contact info. You can contact the uh, Transcribus team through info at readcoop.eu. Um, basically, all of the questions go to them. Um, if you're working in the Benelux uh, or with sources from the Benelux, please join our uh, Canvas uh, uh, platform, uh, which is listed down here. And we can probably help you with uh, getting in touch with people working with similar sources. And if you want to reach me personally, uh, send me an email at transcribus at um, Don't use any of the other email addresses because it will get a bit messy with all of the emails pouring in. So please keep, keep it restricted to this particular email address. Um, so we're going to do the basics today. And you might think this workshop is very lengthy and you might find me uh, going into too much detail um but um yeah some uh, there is a large variety of participants here some have uh, said they want to know more about the desktop some uh, more about the web version um so i'm trying to cover everything if you find me too slow um go drink a cup of coffee or something um you will see with the timeline where we will be um at some point in time and um, since it's being recorded, you will also be able to uh, watch it afterwards as well. So, um, welcome everyone. There are people from all over the world, from Australia to uh, Costa Rica to uh, the Middle East, as well as uh, Northern America. But obviously the main majority is here from Europe, uh, considering that... Um, um, this time zone is probably most convenient for those not either going to sleep or just waking up. So welcome everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be telling you more about Transcribus. Um, I'm not from the read team, I should stress that. Um, uh, I, I'm just an advanced user. I uh, had a project in which I used trans Transcribus extensively and I kind of rolled into doing a lot of workshops and I was supposed to give one in Brussels today which didn't work out obviously and since people are still having lots of questions about transcribers we figured that this digital meeting would be a, a substitute for it although I'm very happy to come and give a workshop uh, at a later point in time so um, keep me posted on that uh, also for the other locations I was uh, scheduled to go to. 
So here you see my timeline and uh, you see the arrows in which I basically summarize whatever we will be dealing with in a, a specific section. And that's the, the arrows will be in the screen all of the time. So this is our program for today. And I'm quite uh, confident that we won't be able to cover all uh, things uh, that people request me to do because they, there were also questions for the more advanced issues. Uh, that will be for another date. Um, but with this uh, as a basis, I'm uh, sure you can all um, be very happy uh, to spend your time in further confinement and um, you, you will have your, um, well, your materials to work on with transcribers. So, um, well, let's go. Um, I want to tell you first a little bit more about Transcribers and Read uh, and Read Project. Um, just to give you a bit of a background, the uh, Read Project was a European-funded project, and this project had uh, as an aim to make text uh, better readable. And um, Transcribers is the tool that came out of that uh, specific project. Um, as the funding has stopped uh, about uh, a year ago, uh, it's now uh, turning into a co-op, a cooperation in which you have members and users and basically at some point in the near future they will be charging you for um, running uh, the HDR technique on your pages. Um, but this price you should keep in mind is uh, meant to maintain the system. Um, Joanna will be uh, talking about this more uh, by the end of this uh, meeting. Um, I, well, I can explain you what uh, Transcribus does, but um, uh, some of my colleagues in Utrecht have uh, found a way to uh, show you in a way better way than I can tell you. So let's give this a go. Just. Just a second. I need to go back to my arrow, I think. Yes, yes. Historical archives contain a treasure trove of information. In filing cabinets, boxes and folders, you can find vast amounts of old maps, letters, monuments, and other often handwritten archival documents. To still be able to see the forest from the trees, archivists create global descriptions of the contents of those cabinets, boxes and folders. Those descriptions of the inventory can easily be searched online at home from your comfy chair. But sometimes a description is not enough. Instead, you'd like to search the text word by word. But that's only possible after having someone typing out all of these documents by hand. And that's really happening a lot. It's called transcribing. Imagine the extraordinary amount of work. But luckily computers can lend us a hand these days. Hmm, that's interesting. Because of major breakthroughs in the field of artificial intelligence, computers can now train themselves to become very good at something in particular. But how does it work with transcriptions? Well, first you'll transcribe a couple of pages by hand, feed this to the computer, that will then start practicing on it. It will check, adjust and improve itself over and over again until the model that is created is good enough. Using this model, the computer can now read other documents in this handwriting that it has never seen before, whether it's 100 or 100,000 pages. Finally, you put it online and from then you can search the full text word by word. Handy! Well, I think that video just uh, kind of explains you what Transcribus does. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, uh, and you can find it online if you want to show it to students or whatever. Um, so what does Transcribus does? Um, what, 
when you have your archives and these are being digitized, um, they provide storage um, and with transcripts they, and they recognize the documents. A computer scientist uh, can have a lot of data um, when put available um, and obviously you as a scholar can also benefit from it um, because you can train your uh, transcribers to recognize your documents and um, with all that knowledge that's being put in transcribers the system becomes better and better and also you have a lot of people doing um, crowd projects and uh, that can also go through transcribers and uh, help create better models uh, which help to um, go from digital paper to data um, some people have asked me to also just briefly mention the scan tent and the doc scan. Um, the doc scan is an app you can download on your Android driven phone. And um, basically, the scan tent you see that on the picture is um, a very neat uh, tool. You can fold it up and have a neat small package to uh, carry along which has a perfect distance to your paper, um, which can be folio, but can also be small size. And when you put your phone on top of the scan tent, you can make pictures. And these pictures um, are already um, um, very sh uh, sharp pictures because the distance is calibrated. And um, when you put, uh, you can select in the app, the option that if you flip the page, that it automatically detects movement and when it detects movement it will automatically create the next page so you can flip through um, it also has lightning in it uh, so led lightning and um, that helps you with uh, good lightning on the document itself which then um, creates good pictures for your um, well for you and you can uh, link the DocScan app to your um, transcribers account so you can automatically upload it into your um, account. Um, it's a very neat uh, feature um, that was also developed in line with the REIT project. So um, you might want to know why I personally use transcribers just to give you a bit of an idea. Um, well, I don't know how to program yet. And um, having said that, I can't use Tesseract or Kraken because these programs require me to, um, to program uh, the settings for each of the characters. Um, so basically I can't use these. And I do like the graphical user interface uh, of Transcribers, although it's a bit challenging at first, so I'm very much aware of that while doing this explanation. Um, but you, you get the hang of it uh, at some point. And I also like the fact that there is a web version, which is easy for crowd projects. Um, in fact, I have two people uh, working on a document for me at this moment. Um, they don't have much to do at this point in time, as you can imagine. So it's really easy to access. I don't need to explain much to them. And these two people just happen to be very happy doing something. Um, well, Transcribers is not just for uh, text recognition. It can also do things with layout analysis um, at a very advanced level. So whatever you uh, need you can basically find it in transcribers whereas um, with kraken or tesseract you would have to program much much more um well the service in innsbruck has have a massive amount of data and um, with that the system becomes smarter and smarter while if you use uh, tesseract or kraken it will only know your training for certain characters and it doesn't learn from much context. So where Transcribers looks at more of the context and has a lot of knowledge in the background in the system, uh, that's not available in, uh, in Kraken because it's just doing the assignment you give it and that's it. It's just one time. Whereas uh, the service in Innsbruck have learned a lot uh, over time now. Um, also because with the uh, project they were able to uh, secure uh, a lot of transcriptions. Um, uh, they, these were made somewhere um, in Asia 
and these uh, are used as uh, basic knowledge for the system to build its knowledge and it's all artificial intelligence so we don't know exactly what the computer does but um, it's very effective um, and with that it's much more effective than a Tesseract or Kraken but obviously these tools can improve so this is the stand of the 21st of April to in 2020 uh, maybe things will improve by tomorrow um, so don't pin, uh, don't don't assume this is uh, going to be the truth for the next coming years but um, this is why I personally use transcribers so I want to tell you a little bit more about HDR and OCR. HDR is handwriting text recognition. OCR is optical character recognition. Well, if you look at these characters uh, in the top of the screen, you will notice that these characters are, well, somewhat strange. You wouldn't really know what to make of it unless you have the context. And that's the same here. Here you have a German word and it's the context that helps you figure out what the, uh, what the text actually says. And um, with, um, well, let's briefly go back, with uh, that context that helps you, uh, that's basically what ha handwriting text recognition also does, where optical character recognition looks mainly at the individual characters Handwriting text recognition looks at whole chunks of text. So it goes back and forth and up and down, but it looks at the, at the context. It looks at more, multiple characters. And with that, um, it learns certain uh, logic from a language. So in most languages, a Q is followed by a U. So the computer will learn that if it finds a something it assumes to be a Q, then the next character is likely to be a Q. Um, so that knowledge helps the computer to recognize uh, the text. So where OCR has a standard font, finite number of characters and a clear background, so basically your, comp your printer kind of output, um, handwriting text recognition isn't as clear cut as, uh, as that. Um, it can be written at any point in time, uh, in any style, uh, any language. Um, um, but it is not just limited to, uh, print, uh, to handwritten text. You can also apply it to printed texts. Um, it's based on uh, machine learning. It has uh, uh, recurrent neural networks, which is basically what I just explained to you with the Q and the U. If it knows that a certain combination of characters is more common in uh, a certain language, then that's something it will build on within your specific model. Um, so that's also why you can't, or it's less possible to use, for instance, a French model on the Dutch language or um, where, but because uh, the verb endings are different, RE or EN uh, respectively. Um, but a Dutch model for German uh, can help its uh, boost, for instance. Um, so there's a lot of mathemat mathematical data behind this for these logical combinations. Um, and what the computer basically does is showing you the best guesses and um, it's confident rating what, uh, what you're being shown. So the computer doesn't really read it just learns that you have signaled that a certain character is a certain character, a certain wobbly thing is a certain character. It learns from that and then it also learns what the logical order is. So it's always best guesses. Um, so when you have a model, um, you need an image, you need uh, ready transcriptions and um, you have to start with about 50 to 75 pages. That is if you don't use a base model. If you do use a base model, and that term is probably very vague for you at this point in time, but I will show you later. And um, if you do use a base model, you can probably start with about 30 to 40 pages for a language. But if there's no model that's anywhere close to your language, then you will need to calculate about 
50 to 75 pages. If you have multiple hands within your documents, you also have to about double the amount of pages because the computer needs to learn different scripts. Um, well, you can obviously test the document, uh, the, the model. Uh, after you run a model, you can always correct it. It's not a finite uh, product. So if you run a model, um, which is kind of close, but not perfect, just correct the uh, transcriptions and um, create a new model that works better for your document. But it means that you don't have to start from scratch. So work with the system and not against it, I would say. Um, you can search through a document much more quickly through transcribers and obviously you can export it. Um, in any kind of way, which we will, we will be dealing with a little bit later on in this, uh, in this session. Um, well, what's the benefit of it? Um, I know a lot of people are very skeptic about using transcribers and also about putting time and effort in uh, learning how to deal with the program. Um, so it's much appreciated that you are here. Um, but give it some thought. When you have quick and efficient transcriptions, um, and you definitely know a lot of people who are very apt in uh, creating transcriptions, and that's all perfectly fine, but think about the amount of archival material that's still there. And these people that know to transcribe are gold. They are very important, and they are very important also to use within this, uh, this system. Um, Thanks to them, we can make text readable. And um, if you have a very apt transcriber, he or she can transcribe about five pages an hour. That's a very good transcriber. Um, maybe you have someone who can do six, that's even better, but let's assume that this person does five pages an hour. And after six hours, someone is gonna be that tired. So that means that person does 30 pages every day. Um, Transcribers does need training. So we still need these 30 pages. It's one day of work or maybe two or three days of work. And then you can create a, um, a HDR model, which takes you about two hours. So I tend to do that at night. Um, and then Transcribers transcribes one page in about 30 seconds maybe a little bit more depending on the size of your page and the amount of text there's on. So folio pages take a lot longer than if you have the very small ones, but 30 seconds to one minute and then you have a transcription of that text. So assuming you have a famous author who wrote million, well, hundreds of pages and you have this person training a model um, in two or three days, and then being able to make the whole corpus searchable. Well, that's kind of ideal, I would say. Um, so we're, you're not putting these volunteers uh, out of business because we really need them er, uh, ever, uh, even with this system, because these people can then train another document and make that accessible and train uh, and you can train new model for those documents to be accessible and considering the kilometers of material there are uh, in the archives this is still very valid and very important work and um, someone just calculated for me that if you would um, digitize the entire archives the state archives of oslo and would have uh, transcribers, you would still need 40,000 transcribers work on it for about 70 years. I'm sorry, but no one's going to live that long. And um, if these, the knowledge of these transcribers can be made uh, useful in a model, that's, that's brilliant. At least that's my opinion. So, um, here are some examples. Um, the Carolingian Miskil, um, um, they have trained about 5,000 words on 1,000 lines and it has a character error rate of 7%. That means, a character error rate means that of every um, 100 words, this amount of words goes wrong. Uh, sorry, characters. So 100 characters, 
in this case, seven characters go wrong. Um, that doesn't mean that it has to be on this page, but that's the calculation from the model. Another example here, you have medieval charters. They have trained about uh, 77,000 words, and it has a character error rate of about 4.8%. A proper model um, should uh, have less than 7%, or at least less than 10% to be really okay readable for humans. If you go if you have a character error rate above 10%, it's not good readable for humans anymore, and you can't process the text through uh, any kind of digital uh, means because the errors are going to be problematic. Um, here you have a uh, set of early mother letters. They have trained 40, uh, uh, 48,000 words, and it has a character error rate of 2.5% uh, uh, character error rate. So that's really um, well readable, machine readable, and um, that's definitely going to improve the possibility of reading the text. Um, and here you have one from the 19th century, which has way more training and it has a 2.5 character error rate. Um, so in this case, out of 100 characters, or I should say, in 200 characters, there are only five characters wrong. Um, so basically, you can compare it to uh, an SMS, and um, in that SMS, um, you have about uh, three to four characters wrong, which makes it still very readable. It might create some misunderstandings, but at least most of the text will be very readable. So what does the uh, neural network do? It goes back and forth, and uh, from that it tries to figure out where pixels are, or what are to be understood as pixels. And from that it figures out where characters are, and these characters are then um, slowly recognized by the computer. So it goes in various levels and back and forth, and we really don't know exactly what neural networks do, but it works. So um, if you are working with printed material, uh, you need way less uh, data. So you don't face uh, 50 to 75 pages, but uh, 20 pages can be enough. And there are already uh, several models available which can help you even uh, um, more. So you would even need less training data. But the more training data, the better your model will work. Um, there's also the possibility of uh, using an OCR engine within Transcribus, which is Abby Fine Reader. Um, I think it's version 12 or something uh, around, that, uh, around that order. Um, so if you're working with printed text, do run Abby first on a couple of pages and then fine tune uh, what's going on uh, and correct it. So um, with printed material, you can have a character error rate of about 1%, which is, um, well, uh, very good and probably uh, as good as when you were typing a text into your computer. So, let's get started. Um, I will first talk a little bit more about the registration. Um, I hope everyone has uh, already installed the program. Um, nearly everyone has already access to the shared folder. Um, we will be coming back to this a little bit later on when I give you some uh, uh, options to practice. But all of the practice options you can also do on your own documents. So you've gone to the website and uh, you have probably registered and uh, tried to download the document. Well, you first needed to register and you might be curious why they asked for your ORCID. Not everyone has an ORCID ID, um, but the, idea, the initial idea was that um, when you're sharing a model that should be contributed to you um, because you're the author. And um, it's not really effective yet, but hopefully in the near future. Um, so that also helps for unique um, registra uh, registrants. Um, 
but don't worry if you don't have an ORCID. It, it will just work fine. And after you've registered, you can download the latest version, which is currently 1.10 um, that is available. And you will always get a, a notification when there's a new uh, version uh, available, and you will see a pop-up in your screen. So when you've downloaded it, you will um, see this uh, screen when you are clicking on the Transcribus uh, logo. Um, there's not much running on your computer. Most of the system is running in Innsbruck. So when you upload your documents, it goes to the server in Innsbruck. When you're working on your documents, they basically retrieve the document from Innsbruck and you're just seeing the images and you can do the uh, things uh, on your computer. But basically you're working on the server in Innsbruck. So keep that in mind. When you're working with sensitive material, you don't want to send it to a server abroad. So keep that in mind. Of obviously, sensitive stuff from the 17th century um, is probably less problematic than when you're dealing with medical registers from the 1950s or something. You, you might need to uh, consult the archive that uh, you're working on, whether you can or cannot share. So, um, you will be uh, seeing a lot of this kind of boxes that I try to show you where I'm working on. Because um, when I will be showing you in Transcribus the working of all the different buttons, you won't be able to see as clearly where I'm working. So I first show you within, um, within the uh, PowerPoint and then I will be showing you in the Transcribus program. So we're now focusing on this uh, little box. And um, I've just highlighted that. Um, you first need to log in. So you, lo you logged in on the website, or you registered on the website, and now you need to log in when you use the program. And um, you find that button here, the, the login button. If the system seems to be failing, um, try to log in and log out, and you do that with the same button. You can also save uh, your login um, uh, credentials so that it will remember you, uh, which is very convenient. So keep in mind, again, I can't stress this enough, that everything will be stored on the server in Innsbruck. Um, but, and that's important too, they are private by default. So it's not like uh, someone's going to snoop around your documents uh, and got, uh, has a run with your data. That's still private. Unless you ask someone to look at a certain problem, then they will uh, ask you for a num an ID number uh, of the document and they can have a look what goes wrong. So that's just to help you. So they're not snooping around. Um, so when you have logged in, um, a couple of test documents will appear in your uh, private collection. And the collection section is over here. And um, you might, um, you are already uh, enlisted to several collections. So the one is private and the other one is this webinar of today. If you haven't uh, been able to get into that section yet, that's fine. Uh, then we'll look into that a little later. Um, and you have been uh, receiving some sample documents uh, by just logging in the first time. So there you can practice uh, as well. So I will show you how to upload documents because that's where we start, obviously. Um, again, we will, uh, well, we need to address where you find the right button. And if you want to upload, you have to look for this symbol. It's the folder with the arrow facing uh, left. So basically, the minimum quality of your uh, photos needs to be 300 dpi. If you're using the scan then don't worry about it. Just buy the right phone and um, or use the right phone, and uh, you should be fine because it's automatically adjusting. Um, if you have pictures that are of less quality, just give it a try. Um, when you have uh, pictures, you will be uh, needing them in P, uh, GP, uh, GPG. A GPEG, a PNG, or TIFF. Um, not in GP2 because uh, that's a sort of 
encrypted uh, way of saving uh, a lot of space, but uh, transcriptors can't deal with it yet. So um, if you have a choice between uh, JPEG, uh, PNG and TIFF, then I would re recommend either JPEG or PNG because TIFF is going to take you a lot of time. Um, and I will be showing you how to upload per folder and not per picture. And um, if you want to upload PDFs, because some uh, institutes um, deliver PDFs of uh, material, then you can go to this one, which is extract and upload images from PDF. So you will click on it and you will click, you will find the right PDF right here. And you can upload the entire PDF. So not just one page, but the entire document. It takes a lot of time uh, because it has to extract basically all the image out of the PDF and then it can upload it to Transcribus. And you can also uh, upload through an URL or an uh, IIIF. Um, uh, just give that a try if that's uh, what you fancy. So keep in mind, you upload a single document. You don't upload per image. Just uh, keep in mind when you're going to the archive or you're working on a book, you take pictures of the entire folder and you put that folder on your computer. And it's that folder that you upload. You want to keep all your archival material uh, together. So I will be showing that in a minute. Um, the performance of the computer does not, or of transcribers does not really depend on the quality of the pixels that it's uh, being uploaded. Um, you, you should just give it a try, um, um, but uh, keep in mind that the more data you feed transcribers, the slower the system will get. So if you download a picture, it gets a little bit slower. Um, that's not bad, but it's not really necessary to upload high resolution uh, images. Obviously, if you have uh, documents that have smudges and things like that, it might be more convenient to have a bit of a higher resolution to uh, be able to discern the ink from the bloods and the blots and whatever you don't want to detect. Um, but that's up to you. So um, if the IIIF manifest isn't working, then just check in with the read team and they will uh, be able to tell you when it will be up again. Um, so I'm going to show you how to work the upload. So here we go. I'm going to our um, shared folders. So I just clicked here that I want to change folders and I'm going to the folder of today and you see a lot of documents here we will come to that later and we're now going to upload a document I'm going to upload a single document which I prepared for today based on a question that was being asked so here I have named the folder uh, after the archival document and I'm gonna tell me. Uh, I can, I'm gonna tell the computer how I want to uh, recognize it. So don't do test one, test test two. You really need to be able to find it back. And I'm gonna upload it. And it's only three three pages, so it's really quick. If it, if you have a bigger document, then um, um, uh, th then just uh, take your time. Um, there's no limit as to how many uh, gigabytes um, transcribers accepts. Um, but I would, uh, uh, yeah, the, the system does uh, slow down if you are uh, uploading hundreds of thousands of pages uh, uh, every time. Um, but it's not really a problem. So there's not a limit to the number of documents that you upload. That is to say that in the near future, when the payment model uh, comes into place, they do want you to think about documents that you do not use very often. So that clutters down the servers um, and 
uh, you might just want to download it at some point in time. So there's not a really limit, but uh, keep it fair. So um, here below, you see this, uh, the two blue arrows. You can click to reload once in a while. And here you see that my uh, document just uh, uploaded uh, into, the, um, into this collection. Um, you might want to upload your documents first to your private folder and then potentially share to another folder, which you do by doing a right click and then duplicate. Um, you can also link to another collection, which might be useful if you uh, are sharing it for um, uh, collective purposes, but you want to be able to have people work in the same document. Um, if you uh, are duplicating your original file remains untouched. So here um, you have an uh, example and uh, I'm very aware that this resolution is very uh, um, very bad but it is supposed to give you a bit of an idea. So I'm moving back to the slides. So now you know where to upload. Um, here uh, we are going to talk about the different versions from Transcribus and um, well you have all downloaded the desktop version and um, it's very detailed. You might already uh, think a lot about all these buttons. You can have your own opinion about it but basically everything is possible. And then there's the web version which you can read through the uh, web address listed here. And it's very basic. Uh, only transcriptions and a few tagging options and there are no distractions. Um, then you also have a third option which is a server API which works through Google and uh, partly through Python which um, basically all the programming geeks can use to upload uh, whatever uh, needs to be uploaded to uh, transcribers, which may be a solution for those people who want to uh, try hundreds of documents straight away. So I'm just going to show you briefly how the uh, uh, web version works because a lot of people have asked me to uh, just briefly show that because they are thinking about collaborative projects. So here um, is the login screen and when you uh, arrive there you see a lot of uh, documents in the public collection but you can also go to my collections. This is the same as the collections you have within uh, the Transcribus uh, document where I just showed you where to find our shared um, folder. So when you click on that, uh, you you click on my collections and you go to the folder that you uh, that you want or you direct someone else to go to a specific folder. Um, everyone needs his or her own account within Transcribus. Also when you're doing some collaborative project they all need their own um, their own account and you can share uh, documents to that specific account. So here you see uh, one of my uh, folders, which is called Plakaten, which is Dutch, uh, the Dutch word for early modern legislation, basically. And uh, you see that there are several documents uh, available here. You could click on uh, the little arrow and you would have a, a fold-out screen and you could uh, select uh, various documents. And you can also click on the status and um, you can choose between uh, pages that are uh, basically um, in progress, someone is already working on that or um, um, uh, documents that are done or documents that are uh, ground truth. So that will be shown up here. And you can also see who changed it. So if multiple people are working in the same document, they can see who has already worked on a certain document. So when you click on, uh, let's say, uh, you click on uh, a, a certain page, you click on plain text, then you can um, see the document. Here I already ran a, uh, a model on, and you can see that here it's highlighted, and um, that corresponds with this first text region, um, and you can see the text. So your transcriber is being guided through the text. 
So if he clicks here, you will be automatically guided to the next line and it will highlight so the person doesn't need to search for um, where he or she needs to transcribe the text. Um, in this little box, you see uh, in progress, if, uh, that's, uh, if the page is ready, they can click on done. Um, they can also click on whether a word is unclear. So you as the, the host or the, the chief of the project can have a look at what goes wrong and you might need to correct those uh, sort of words. And obviously you can save. Um, so that's about the, uh, the web version. Are there any questions about this? Please uh, use the chat for, uh, box if you do have questions on this. I will be showing you how to share documents uh, a little later on. So this is the, the web version and uh, most of our focus will be on the desktop version because that's what most people tend to use. Um, but if you have, um, well, for instance, your parents or the neighbors who can't go out these days, they might want to help you and you can, um, well, have, have them work on the desktop version because there are not too many buttons. Well, we're going to do the buttons, which is um, probably the, uh, the most boring part, but also the most important part. And um, after I uh, explain the purpose of these buttons and the layout analysis, we will, um, um, we will have a short break um, and just uh, very briefly on uh, the collaboration with the, uh, the team will be dealt uh, with in uh, the section after that. So um, we will be dealing with it uh, a little bit later on. So buttons, that's going to be uh, um, very um, elaborate, but also hopefully very useful. And do download the slides afterwards so you can have a look at this uh, section later on if you're a bit confused, which I can totally imagine. So I'm going to show you where we are, which is the orange box, and that's the server tab. Um, here you can uh, go back to uh, versions uh, of your documents. So you can always go back. There's ne uh, nothing gets lost. You just save a new version. Um, so if, uh, if your cat happened to hit the wrong button, then just click versions and go back to the previous version. Um, you have the user manager, which is where you can add people to your, uh, to your folder. Don't, please don't do that to your private documents. So uh, when you are here in your private collection, then don't add people to that. You don't want them messing around with your documents and having to keep track of who you gave access. So create a new folder and give people access to their shared documents to the, in that particular uh, document. So you have user activities, so you could uh, see what everyone has been doing. Um, if you are looking for your most recent document, then you just click on this and you get a drop out and you can click on it. Um, here the jobs uh, shows you what uh, things you have set in motion. So whether you're creating a, a model or whether you're doing an HDR job, at that point in time, you can uh, monitor it. And uh, the Austrian humor in it is obviously that you can see how long or that you have still time to drink your coffee. I um, have actually never used the, uh, the document manager. I have no idea what to do with it. So, and with uh, over two years of use now, I don't think you will be needing, uh, needing that, but otherwise please do delve into it. Um, so this very long bar uh, with, with buttons is the next one we will be dealing with. And it basically has all the functionalities you will be using a lot. So you go to the main menu, uh, you have the login, so you can quickly click on that too. Um, you can hide all of the, the left panel things, you can hide the transcription uh, field. Um, so if you get lost where your um, uh, transcription field is just click on this one or you could click on here on the profiles and you can uh, have these fields appear again. Here you can um, um, uh, see a uh, local document on the computer and here is where you import the documents. 
This one is to export your document and this is to refresh. And here you have keyword spotting on which I will be dealing later. And again, a job symbol. And um, um, this is the same as you saw in the server tab. Um, so we move on. We go to the next section. Well, you can search your documents and you can go back and forth. Um, uh, and you can um, reload uh, the document and you can obviously, very important, save your document. What you see here is that this document is new and you can click on it and you can change that into progress uh, or final being done or also ground truth. Ground truth is uh, very uh, important um, for training models. So the last uh, bit of the um, toolbar, I already said it here, you can change the, uh, uh, the status of your document. Um, here you can also go back to another version of your document. This is where you find the XML. Um, if you want to look at the XML for the uh, document, it's over here. Um, if you have problems with uh, the order in which lines are being shown or whether uh, you need to show your baselines on which we will be dealing um, in the next uh, few slides, um, then you can click on this little eye and you can select the various um, options. So you can uh, show the reading order or you can so also show the line order. Um, this is to um, zoom. Uh, these are basically all to zoom. Um, so I should be pointing here. These are all to zoom. And um, these little dots here, um, can show you the um, uh, the image whether you want to um, uh, change the order or uh, rotate it. Um, then you can change the color of the color scheme, and um, you um, uh, can show the uh, edit toolbar. So don't touch that one because then you lose your edit toolbar uh, in. Well, that's one of the most important uh, um, toolbars you will be seeing. Um, and this little bug here is for the bug requests or, or the bug reports and the feature requests. So let's see. Um, layout analysis. That's basically the first we start when we have a uh, document uh, we want to work on. And that's edit toolbar, which you can remove uh, if you click on this particular button. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it because you need it. Um, um, here you have the uh, toolbar. So the toolbar has a couple of uh, abbreviations. So TR is text region. Line, um, I never use that one because baseline just works as well. Um, I, I just choose between them. And you can uh, also do individual words. Um, these individual words are basically marginalia or when someone scribbled something down within in the middle of the text. And then you have these uh, three dots, which is specific shapes. So tables uh, you can find here. You don't do tables with the text region because you want to be able to have that uh, differently marked within your XML. And also a new feature that can be expected in the future is that table recognition goes better and that you can then um, recognize much better what's in, uh, what's in a certain column or in a certain line. So please do use the table option. It does take a lot of time, um, but it might be worthwhile uh, if you're in need of a proper recognition of tables. So there are a lot of options down here. Um, you can delete. Um, and one of the uh, fun buttons I, uh, I'm using lately is the merge selected shapes. Um, that is if the computer automatically detects uh, a text and it happens to break up a line, you can merge these two uh, sets from the one line together. Um, and you can undo uh, things with this one, um, which is the green arrow. So segmentation, you click on the text region, the TR button, and you draw a box. 
which is basically you click on the one point and you drag it to the other point. And we will be practicing with this. Um, and then there's the option of uh, doing baselines because the computer doesn't know where text is. That might sound strange, but the computer is totally oblivious as to what is text and what are just, well, uh, it may recognize that there are some uh, discoloring of the page, but you need to tell the computer where the base of the text is. So you will be clicking one click on the one side and then end up with a double click on the, on the right side. Um, you see that there are some dots around here um, as well. If you do it manually, it's just one click on the one spot and a double click on the end. The computer will uh, be more precise to some extent by uh, following the text uh, and making more clicks, basically. So what I want you to what I would like you to do is go to the collection of the webinar and um, you just select a document and then you go to the tab meta metadata and you go to document and here in title you change um, the name of the document and at the bottom you save because you can't work with multiple people on one page because when you save something, it's, um, um, it disappears. Um, only one person at a time can save uh, the text uh, on one page. So you go to a certain document, you go to metadata and where you find documents, you change it and you change it to your name and you save it because you don't want people messing around with your document. And when you've done that, you go to text region and you draw basically draw the box. So here's my text and here's another one. And I took a particular messy page, um, which was a request of someone uh, was joining us today. And um, I now have my text region, which I can show you by clicking on the arrow and clicking on the field that I just created with the text region. And when I now want to do the baselines, I click and I end. And yes, I want to create a line as well. And we go and continue this. And yes, I'm very much aware that the computer can take this uh, and do this which I will be showing you in the next slide. But it's important for you to know how you can manually do this because sometimes you need to correct it. So please give it a try. Uh, change the name of the document and um, try to draw a text region around the text and also create a couple of baselines. And um, take about five minutes for this and then we'll, uh, we'll be continuing uh, further on. So take a couple of minutes to practice or take a little bit of a break, for instance. And you don't have to make a box around each line. You just indicate the whole text region and then the baselines go for each sentence. Well, you do need to undo something if you are uh, clicking too often, then just press escape. So escape is always the safe option. If you were drawing a text region and you figure out you don't need it anymore, um, just press escape. If you want to delete something, just make sure you go back to the arrow, click on it and then press delete. Um, depending on your wishes, whether you want, uh, uh, if you have columns then just mark it as columns. So you create two text regions. Um, uh, but if there is, uh, let's see if I can find an example. Um, let's go to the next page. I think I may have a better accent. Um, you can also say uh, accept parent line. Um, it always needs the parent line. Um, let's say that um, here you have a nice example here. The text, uh, basically the line is broken. Um, depending on what you want, you can... Um, I need to draw a text region first. So I create text region. I know this is a very damaged page, but um, 
I would draw the baseline just to continue. Um, and But if you prefer, you could also just create it in uh, two separate bits because you might fear that this, um, this tier will um, end up in bad results in your um, HDR. Uh, then in your transcription, then you just create two uh, lines. If you have like uh, columns or table formats, then um, I would uh, recommend uh, using the uh, the table option. So you would need to draw every little bit, but that would make it easier to recognize. Or if you don't care about the table format, then you could just go per line. So manually, you create the text region first, and then you do the baselines. If there's a problem, you can always press escape to get out of it. Um, um, if, whether you want to include marginalia or not, um, depends on your preference. I would always uh, create a separate a text region for that. And uh, the reason for that is also because it's some uh, additional information and uh, you might find it useful to um, have the option of searching for marginalia. Um, I will briefly mention where you can actually uh, give that a, a specific name. Uh, you can give all the text regions specific names and that would be something for the more advanced uh, workshop. Um, because you can actually train the computer to recognize certain text regions as well. So let's continue. Um, because you all also want to know um, uh, uh, how you can do this automatically and um, save a lot of time with all your documents. So um, Obviously, with such a damaged document, um, Transcribe it doesn't do magic, so it doesn't solve the problem of what text is missing. Um, I would then personally uh, choose for drawing the baselines by hand, because um, you can um, figure out how the lines uh, really work. And yes, it can be auto done automatically. Um, here... Um, um, uh, just briefly, when uh, text uh, is inserted, so either marginalia or just one word is being inserted in the text, you do that by clicking on uh, word, uh, the, the W, uh, and you then draw a little box around that one. So, layout analysis can be done automatically. And you go to um, this little field again, and now you go... Um, Sorry, you go to uh, tools and I'm going to show you and I'm going to zoom out. Oops, I need my arrow. And when I go to, here, uh, to tools, I can choose for this little section, which is the layout analysis section. And on my current page, I want to find text regions and I say run. It's going to save my previous transcription, which wasn't really necessary in this case, but... And now it's running, and you can see that with a teacup or coffee cup. And it's running the layout analysis. And at some point it will ask whether it should reload the, uh, the document. And I say yes, because I don't need to save whatever I had before. And now it has recognized the text. Sometimes it may not be entirely correct, but uh, I could then uh, change that. I could delete it and draw a new one, or I could um, um, just correct it. If the line is broken, let's, uh, let's assume that certain lines are... Yeah, let's see. Yes, here we have a broken line. We know as humans that this is actually one line. And now I can merge these by clicking on the merge shapes uh, arrow. And then it combines these two. 
So that's how you combine broken lines. Um, so this is how it's being done automatically. If you want to, uh, you can do the, um, the recognition of text regions by hand. And then you say, you unclick this little box and you say that it only needs to find the lines. So if you want to be in charge of where the uh, text regions are, you can do that by, by hand and then have the computer detect all the lines. So this is how you automatically detect the, uh, the lines within the document. And you can do that for uh, one page per time, which is here, current page, but you can also uh, click on that you want to recognize multiple pages. In this case, my document only has, true, has three pages, so it can only detect in three pages. But if your document happens to uh, count like a thousand pages, it can do 1000 pages. It takes a little longer, but it can do it. Um, so, um, that's how you do the automatic layout analysis. Um, what could be interesting to know is that the, um, when you have the other fields, there is also overview where you can see, um, which pages are, um, um, in progress or are being done. You can get an overview of all the pages in small uh, miniatures, and you could actually use the uh, document manager to uh, remove certain pages or shuffle the pages in different order. But I tend to um, use them in the order that I photographed, uh, took photos of them. Um, then you also have the button layout, um, which is shown here. And you see here, text region, and you see all the lines there. It has, and they, these have coordinates, which uh, indicate a computer where you can, uh, where you can find the, um, uh, the specific uh, sentence. If you were to click on here on structure, you could uh, give it a specific name. So you could actually call a text region a marginalia, or you could uh, call it a header or a, um, uh, paragraph. Um, so that would be helpful if you want to do automatic layout analysis, which is um, more advanced. First get a handle of how it works. Um, let's briefly go back to the um, Um, uh, printed block detection is probably mainly used for newspapers. Um, that's if you have a lot of columns and um, you wouldn't need that. Uh, there are also very many, uh, there are many op uh, options if you click on configure um, that has to do with where you have the text. And if you're working with postcards and such things, then you could actually choose from here. But if you're um, a very, um, very much a beginner, I wouldn't go into, uh, into do doing anything with these buttons. So uh, the block uh, detection is uh, mainly for uh, printed texts and if the texts are really squared. So, um, Let's see, the tool tab um, is the last tab of the, uh, of, the, um, of the five tabs up here. <laughs> There's no other word for it. And um, you can do all sorts of analysis here. Here you have the HDR uh, city lab, uh, sit lab uh, analysis, which is what you're mostly interested in. But you can also um, uh, click on this one and it will show you, I'm briefly going to show you that you can do every fine reader and you can run that. And obviously it's not going to work on this text, but I'm just briefly going to show you. You can um, choose which kind of uh, font you're working with and then you can select the language, which will give you a little bit of a detection, but it isn't uh, entirely perfect, um, uh, especially for Dutch Gothic, you can 
probably better use the uh, HDR model that's publicly available. So um, in the tool tab, um, you have the option for HDR and um, um, but also here where you can just what I just briefly showed you, you can uh, find the text regions or you can find the lines. If you already did the text regions by hand, then you unclick that box and then you go and find the text regions. So a brief summary. You first upload your documents into the server, do a, a layout analysis either manually or automatically. Um, if you are in need of um, figuring out where titles are, where the body of the, uh, of the text is, where your marginalia are, keep that in mind when you are starting to create your layout analysis. Um, and then you can start transcribing. Um, and we will be dealing with it uh, in a minute. Um, and when you have a, a number of pages available, so either 30 to 50 approximately, you can start making a, a model. That's what I just mentioned in the previous section. And we're now going over, um, well, the real deal, how to transcribe, uh, especially where and how. And um, I al also want to focus a bit on the collaboration um, and there were several questions on the um, um, abbreviations italic conventions um, and these kinds of methods. So um, where and how to transcribe? Well, I don't need to tell you how to type your text into the computer, but I do need to show you where to find the right, uh, the, the right sections and also how to deal with all these various buttons. So, um, I have a document here loaded, uh, as you can see, and um, here you see the image, which you get by double clicking on the document uh, in your server uh, tab. So the server tab, uh, and you have already opened the document, so you double click on it and it loads. Well, here you see I've loaded page uh, 14 and um, you see the image. So, and um, you also see the text below. So this has been transcribed by, uh, uh, I think I did this, one, this page because my parents are currently doing transcriptions for me as well, um, as a way of puzzling these, these days. And then we also have a uh, another toolbar, don't get frustrated by the amount of toolbars, you'll get the hang of it. Just take your time to adjust to the amount of uh, toolbars um, that Transcribus has available. Um, what you also see is here a number in front of each of the lines. This is also to guide you through where you actually are. So when you click on it, it highlights just as you have seen in the web version. Um, so what I very much like about this tool is that, um, well, when you're reading a text um, the old fashioned way, you could get screwed and you would miss a line in your transcription. And here you're basically being guided through. The first number is also then an indication of in which uh, text region you are. So the first uh, number is the text region. The second uh, number is the line you're working on. So that's just uh, for the uh, for the text regions. So you just saw this little uh, bar at the bottom, which is the transcription toolbar, and we have several uh, buttons again. Um, you want, might want to delete a shape. You want to have a long dash because people tend to fill out the line. Uh, you can use that. If you uh, have a word that um, starts at the end of, uh, of a line, continues at the, um, the beginning of the other one, you can use this, uh, this dash. Um, you can toggle a paragraph. You can use the uh, virtual keyboard. I guess you all know uh, basically what these kind of buttons mean. If you're working with Word or whatever text, um, uh, program, then you know these. Um, you can um, scratch word and um, here you can change the font preference. 
not really that uh, interesting, but if you are not uh, happy with the font that it shows, then you can change to another one. Undo redo and text orientation. For everyone working with um, Eastern scripts, Arabic or Hebrew, um, the text orientation button is very important. You can click on it and then you can change whether you want it from left to right or right to left. If you're just do doing a uh, European script, um, then uh, you don't need to even bother about remembering this, but just for everyone uh, working with Arabic or Hebrew, um, find this button and you will be able to write in the right, uh, right to left order. Um, you can also move the transcription field, which you just saw below, uh, to the left, and then it will be next to your text. Um, if you find that more suitable, be my guest. And you also have transcription settings, which is a button that uh, if you need it, or if you are having questions about it, just have a look. Um, it's something I've never used thus far. Um, so that's where you do transcriptions. So you basically write uh, guided by which line you are at and um, continue to transcribe the text or correct the, uh, the text um, if you have run a model and you need to improve the text. So um, I want to briefly uh, elaborate on the collaboration within Transcribers because when you're transcribing, that might be something you are collaborating with people on. So uh, I can't stress it enough. Everyone needs an individual account. It's not that difficult to set up. Uh, you all managed, so you can probably help others do that. Um, but then the, the questions rise, whether everyone needs to have the ability to do layout analysis. Does everyone need to be able to do the clicking and creating the boxes? Or does everyone need the, uh, the need has so, Sorry, does everyone need the possibility to work with models? Um, if yes, then use the desktop version. It will take you a little bit of time to explain it to people or you just send them to the link of this webinar. Um, but it's more challenging. If you have um, people who want, just want to do transcriptions for fun as a puzzle or as a way of spending their leisure time, don't bother them with um, all these features. Uh, research has shown that the more tasks people need to deal with, the more bored and the more frustrated they will get. So if they just want to do transcriptions, make sure you do the layout analysis and do the model thing and whatever. So you can share a folder to everyone who needs this. I will show you in a minute. And if multiple people work on a document, you might want to coordinate who is working on which page. Because if you are working on the same page and you're saving it and your next door neighbor is saving it like three minutes later, then uh, only the latest will be, um, um, will be visible. And it's also a lot of work to just be doing the same page. Uh, so give that a thought. Or give people each a separate document to work on. Um, also, what I see with my colleagues is that they have a list of conventions. Um, um, for instance, uh, use Unicode uh, for, spe for specific uh, characters. Um, early modern texts tend to have these wobbly things uh, for abbreviations, um, but also for just for um, conventions, what you want to do when there's a large space. Do you want them to use a dash or do you not want to have them use a dash? Do you want them to use the, uh, the hooky thing um, at the end of a sentence when a word is broken over two lines? Just write it down and uh, give that some thought. Um, but it can be a document as a work in progress. Um, if you have helpers with different levels of experiences, um, create multiple folders in which you uh, put documents depending on source complexities. So I've, uh, I've assigned uh, a 
a document to uh, the people who are helping me, which is late 17th century, they can more or less easily read it, but I wouldn't go as far as giving them a 16th century document because that takes more practice and they will get frustrated. So we're slowly gonna develop the transcription skills and um, I don't wanna burden them with seeing a document that's way beyond uh, what they can do now. So you can have different folders um, and select uh, documents uh, um, regarding of the complexity. So when you're in this field, you um, need to go to the user, man uh, user manager. And again, don't do this to your private folder. Uh, and you can uh, click to uh, show people and add people to um, this specific folder. And just a second, I'm going to show you within Transcribus. Here we go to user manager. And this is the folder we are now all having, or basically all having access to. Um, you can search for a certain name. Um, let's see, um, I'm going to search for myself, which is Annemieke domain. And I'm going to search. In this case, I'm not going to find myself, obviously. Let's see. I have various ways of uh, finding myself and I can add, add this user and I can choose which role I want to give this person. Um, in this case, I'm already owner, but let's assume I want to be able to have someone edit uh, the text so the, this person has more options or I just want this person to be transcriber. That's the, uh, the least of, uh, well, basically the least of the options. Uh, the person can only write transcriptions and a reader can't do anything but view. Um, let's assume that I uh, uh, would like to change a role of a person. Um, I could here remove the person. I know this person isn't available at this point in time, um, but instead of an editor, I could change his role as well. And with that, I successfully changed it to transcriber or I can uh, uh, change back and have this person have a different role again. Um, you can, let's see if I, uh, when I go to um, um, one of my private documents, my private collection, I recently did a transcription of this document. I can link it to a different collection. In that case, uh, someone can change it and the corrections or changes are being visible within my original document, but I can also duplicate it and have my own uh, documents safe from cats walking on keyboards or whatever, uh, what this uh, other person might be doing. Um, so depending on how well you trust uh, the person you're collaborating with, you can choose from linking it uh, or duplicating it. Duplicating means you have two different documents and linking it will just mean that uh, you basically have another door entry to your document. So I'm going back to the webinar. Oh. Um, if you need to create a new collection, just click on collections and click here on create and you create a, uh, the new collection. So that's on how you create and manage uh, the users. Um, if you want to share it with all other users, then you can just uh, um, create a folder and have every new person added to that specific folder. So here you see again, uh, that I briefly, uh, where you can search for names, you can search by email address, username, first name, last name, um, depending on what data you have been provided with. Um, you can add this person and then you can choose which role this person will have in this specific folder. So now we're going to deal with um, 
the abbreviations, italics, conventions, etc. So you're going to do a diplomatic transcription. So hardly any editorial interventions or interpretations. Um, just write what you see because you need the computer to learn. And you're going to tell the computer that a certain character is an A and another character is a B. Um, when there are special characters such as uh, um, um, A accent aigu or A accent grave, uh, you can use Unicode uh, to uh, organize that. Um, maybe your keyboard already um, um, supports it, but if there are special characters, just find the Unicode abbreviation so that uh, the Unicode uh, character so that uh, the computer can learn how it's uh, supposed to uh, write it down when it encounters it. So there are basically two ways of dealing with abbreviations. Um, most uh, of the computer specialists I talk to prefer that you keep the abbreviation. Why? Because you can always, um, when you have your output, you can search for a certain abbreviation and uh, convert that afterwards. Um, you may have noticed that there is also the option of a um, of working with the indication of an abbreviation and. Um, just briefly going to show you. And yes, let's assume that six is here an abbreviation. Then we could potentially tag it as an abbreviation. If we have expanded it, you could tag it as being an abbreviation, which is right click and then tag it as an abbreviation. Um, you could also tag places, persons, etc., with this uh, button, uh, but it's basically more for advanced uh, use. But when you create a model and you have uh, filled out the abbreviations, um, so you have the etc., the et uh, and the c, and you have created that into etc. as the full word, then the model will not know that it's um, that it was originally an abbreviation so it won't show you anymore uh, on the pages you run your model on that there was originally a abbreviation in the text so if you're out there trying to get your text as readable as possible you have the possibility of expanding the abbreviation within the transcription already or you could post process that by um, first writing the et cetera as, an, um, as short as possible and then expand it afterwards uh, by searching through the text and uh, changing that. Um, as said, most computer specialists prefer you to use the abbreviation, but try to be as consistent as possible. Um, I've also had, uh, in one of the workshops I gave, someone asking me uh, about the um, uh, Roman numericals, whether they should write the X as 10. No, don't. Just write them down as Roman numericals. Because you will be training a computer that an X is a 10. If you then would encounter the, the very banal example of sex, you would end up with it transcribing that as S a 10. You don't want to have that. And the same goes for the, the, the number one in Roman numericals. If you have the, if it's transcribed as an I, there's no problem. But if you write it down as a one, then you would end up in trouble with uh, words in which the I uh, would um, happen to be. Um, you just notice that in the uh, transcription field, you have the option of uh, tagging it something as being in italics. I know that's very important in most transcriptions, but the model doesn't understand that. Uh, why not? The model basically supports 100 characters, and that's very much enough for uh, most alphabets. Um, 
so you have the ABC uh, in uh, small, uh, small characters, but also capitalized, and you have already uh, two times 26 uh, characters. You have the, uh, the question mark, the dot, the comma, etc., etc., and you can basically go to up to 100 characters. This is also why you can't use transcribers on Chinese, um, because Chinese has way, way more um, uh, characters than uh, 100. So it doesn't work. And um, with italics, the problem is that um, it's um, going to add up to your uh, to, to those um, characters and that making it uh, very difficult for a computer. So it can either support uh, straight up uh, characters or in italics, but it doesn't really do uh, either one of them because the difference is too small. Um, so keep uh, 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 transcribe what you see. If some character isn't there, then don't add it to the text because you need the computer to learn to look at um, at the image, and then you basically train the computer by telling, well, the first character is this uh, A, and the second character uh, resemble uh, or is a B. And the computer needs to learn from looking at these, um, well, written scripture to what you would uh, want it to transcribe in uh, the transcription field. So any questions this far on the uh, collaboration or on making transcriptions? If not, we can continue to making models. Yes, um, uh, I will be dealing with the question of sharing models as well in this section. So we go on, on models, we go on, on how to create a model, how to export files and also how to search files. And um, after that, uh, Joanna will be talking about the, uh, the read co-op and we will have uh, the possibility of asking way more questions after that if you're still in need for uh, for that. Um, yes. Well, um, how to use an existing model um, and how to uh, uh, create one will be in the next session and also language models and dictionaries. So we're back to the screen and we're gonna deal with the section in tools. We already briefly mentioned that we will be looking at the text recognition field. Um, if you click on the button models, you will get a full list of what is already available uh, publicly. And you see here, it selects public models. And um, these are publicly available within every single um, collection. If you have a specific collection um, and you created your own models or someone shared a model, you won't be seeing every uh, model in that specific um, uh, collection. Let's give you an example. And we're going back to the, uh, to the program. I'm going to go to the models. Sometimes the, um, you may not yet have the training button. That's something you need to request, but we'll deal with that later. Here you see models and here it says all. Publicly available models was what I just showed you. And if I now click on in collection, you will see that I've added a couple of uh, models. If you are in need of a, uh, a model, um, in French or Danish or, uh, um, well, I don't think, oh yeah, I put in one in Dutch and French. Um, you can do right click and share model and you can add it to 
your personal collection, for instance. Um, you can then copy it there and say OK, and you send it to your own collection. If you are in need of one of these uh, models, you can, uh, you can just share them to your own folder. So these are within a collection. Um, so if you're collaborating within a project and you are in need of a specific uh, model, make sure you share it to that specific collection. Um, yeah. So here you have the, uh, a whole range of uh, various models that is already publicly available. You can see we used it. You might want to credit the person if you're using uh, your text for uh, um, um, uh, research purposes and it made your life a lot easier to use a specific model then uh, feel free to credit this person or this uh, this model on your literature list um, why is it useful to um, include a model um, privately within a collection or uh, when it's not yet publicly available, that can have to do with copyright issues. Um, so I know from colleagues that they are working on a, a current project. The project is to run for like three or four years and they're still working on creating a model that is as good as possible. Uh, they're not there yet, but um, they are willing to share it with other colleagues who can then benefit from it. Uh, so you would uh, be able to share it with each other to work on it collectively. Um, and there are also people who do not want to share it yet because uh, they may uh, need it for a specific publication. Um, but I could um, add to that that um, in this case you see the Roman type uh, print which has a uh, character error rate of 1.2%, uh, which means uh, 99 characters are correct and one of them is probably somewhere along the line not quite as correct as you would like. Um, and you can also see that it shows, uh, you can't click on show uh, training set and you can't click on show validation set. Within some of the models, you can, you can click on these and you can see what kind of pages were being used to create this model. Um, if you are having copyright issues because of uh, using images from Google or whatever, um, you can share your model and ask transcribers to keep uh, the training set uh, private as well as the validation set. Um, so then you can share. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable sharing uh, because uh, you're not uh, happy with the results yet, then you can do that uh, uh, privately. So um, let's go to the next slide. Let's um, apply a model. So you now know where to find the model. So you can actually look up whether there's a model that is uh, anywhere close to your language or the language you're working with. And uh, now we're going to try and run a model. So this is where everyone becomes happy because much, much work is being done. So you click on run and you have to select one. And in this case, you uh, search for one in the, the public models. And then you go to, uh, you, you have just selected one. So you click on run, you select one and you get this. Uh, if you click on run, you go to this menu that pops up. And you can choose whether you want to run it on the current page, if you want to test it, or if you're already confident enough, then you can basically run it over every single page. And here you click on select HDR model, and that's where you come in with the field where you can select whatever you need. And then you click on OK. And that's when the magic happens. So I'm going to briefly show you. Let's see. Um, I'm going to go to one of the documents I know quite well. There's something like Dutch newspaper. Um, yes, Dutch newspaper. I'm going to run this. First, obviously, I need to open it. 
I briefly have to find all my text regions. So you always need to do a layout analysis first. This is obviously some form of Gothic. Dutch Gothic is different from German Gothic. And in a few, we will be seeing the layout analysis. It's currently running. So yes, I do want to see. And here we go. You see that it has made some of the uh, lines available. So I click on run. I want to select an HDR model. In this case, I need a public model. You don't need to select from this, but this goes quicker for me. And here I have Dutch Gothic print. It says that it's from the 16th, 17th and 18th century. It's a relatively good model. So, and no, I'm not choosing it because I created it. It's just very convenient in this case. And yes, I do want to start HDR. And it says once job started, and um, now we wait. This may take about 30 seconds to one minute. Um, in the meanwhile, I will be explaining a, another step. Some people find it very convenient if you would be using a language model. So what I was explaining in the beginning about the engram, just knowing in which order certain characters appear, uh, either being Q followed by U or um, E, uh, double, uh, e N on the end of Dutch verbs or R A at the end of uh, many French verbs. Um, you can, so when you select a model, you can click here on the language model um, uh, field and you can choose a language model from, uh, from the training's data. So it has learned from the training data it had um, what logical orders are. And you can uh, uh, also uh, choose for a custom dictionary. I wouldn't recommend it for uh, most of the periods in time because you can, can get over uh, overcorrection, um, which means that it will uh, autocorrect texts that uh, may have been uh, spelled differently uh, over time. So when you um, do want to do, use the custom dictionary and you have to contact the transcribers team and they can load that into uh, the system. Um, if you don't, do not have the option of choosing the language model, uh, you will have to update your, uh, uh, your transcribers. Um, so, so the language model uh, uh, helps to correct words according to what is known in the model. Um, I wouldn't do it for very small uh, models or when you're just testing it. Um, you could um, use it for uh, the larger models uh, best. Um, you can't implement a custom dictionary yourself. You will need to have uh, help from Innsbruck for that. Um, I'm just briefly returning to my, uh, to my text and I now have the results back from the HDR and here it um, shows you uh, the results, which is very well readable. You might notice that uh, the beginning of the text, it shows a double V and not a W. Um, um, but since you don't want overcorrection, um, it has been transcribed as two V's since that's what is uh, written down here. Uh, written down in the text, obviously. So you can uh, have a look at the uh, model and it will show you the, um, well, how well it performed. This one is very big. It has uh, been trained on many, many words and many lines. And it shows you uh, that on the training set, it has a, a character error rate of uh, 7.6. And on the validation, it has a 6.2. The validation set is the set um, you assign to it to test whether model functions. And it also, um, um, 
uh, gives an indication of how it would perform on unseen text. Um, another very useful button is um, that you, with each model you can click on show characters. And what you will see is in Unicode which characters are already recognized. This can be beneficial when you create a new model and you're not sure whether you've covered all grounds. So uh, you may not have covered all digits or uh, maybe not all the uh, um, parentheses. Uh, maybe that's uh, not available within the um, uh, within the uh, model itself. So then you know that uh, certain characters won't be recognized or maybe need more training. Um, if you need OCR, a set that's available too, you have to go to uh, text recognition, you click on the method and you change it to OCR. Um, it is then as shown here and you can click on run and you choose which language uh, and which kind of character. And you can then again correct the text in the transcription field. So you now want to know probably how to create your own model. Um, I should stress that not every language is already available as a model. Um, you might want to contribute to that. Um, it might be that there are groups working on a model, but that they haven't gotten enough training data or, well, maybe they have copyright issues, but they might be willing to share with you. So contact Innsbruck and ask whether there is something available already. Um, if you're in need of one of the models that is shared within the collection of today, then just copy it to your own uh, folder and um, um, use it to your advantage. These uh, models have all been uh, uh, added to, um, to be shared, but they aren't publicly available as these are still work in progress. Um, so to train a model, you need a training button. And that's not standardly available within your uh, set of transcribers. You have to email uh, at a well-known address by now, info at readgoop.eu, and it may take a few days. Um, why don't they put it publicly available? Because not everyone will be using it. And it's also to make you aware that uh, if you have transcribed two pages, you can't train a model yet. You will need much, much more. So. Keep that in mind, um, sit down, create a lot of transcriptions first and then request the button and then uh, the joy begins. So you notice that here I have the, uh, the button to train. Um, for, you, for most of you, the, the model button will just be bigger and you won't see this, uh, the absence of this button. So you go to, uh, uh, the HDR method, you go to train and you hit train and then this screen pops up. And as you can see, I have uh, to fill out a model name. Um, I also have to fill in what language I have and I have to give a little bit of a description. Generally speaking, I would advise to write down what kind of sources you've used. So whether you have used political sources, whether you've worked on economic sources, um, what kind of periods you've worked on. So write that down um, just for your, for your own memory. And then here for the overview, you click on ground truth. Why ground truth? Because this is the text that you have manually corrected and you're quite certain that it is uh, as, uh, as good as possible. Here, you see a, uh, a folder which is uh, uh, within a collection and here you see all the pages. So you click, can click on the little arrow which is a drop down menu and you can see all the pages. And since I have now selected ground truth only, I will only be seeing or will only have the possibility to click on the, uh, on the pages that are in uh, ground truth status. And I can then uh, select these. Um, I need to send about 90% of my training material in the field of training. 
and then uh, ten percent of my um, of my pages go in the validation. So if you have the um, if you have made like a hundred pages, ninety go into the one box and ten go into the other. What then happens when uh, transcribers uh, servers go over your text? They go and learn from your transcription and they look to the picture and they learn by going back and forth. But then you have this validation set and it's going to test whether this model that it creates functions and whether it can decipher the new text. And to know whether it is correct, it needs this, uh, the transcription of the validation pages. So it can see, did I do a correct job or do I still need to prove? Uh, improve myself and that's where the um, the calculations from the percentage come from so here you see the number of apples that is how many times the computer looks at the text so how many times does the computer go over these training pages and checks it with your transcription um, 50 apples 15 times uh, looking at the text seems to be um, um, uh, maybe a little, uh, maybe not so much for some model, uh, if you are, really have a massive model, you will uh, maybe need to change that to a higher number, but uh, 50, paid, uh, 50 times looking at the text is probably uh, gonna solve, uh, or is probably gonna create a very good model already. So, uh, and that's with the uh, the, the um, 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 when you have ninety percent training and ten percent uh, uh, validation, it will look at these uh, texts fifty times each. So why again do you have ninety percent of training? Because it needs to work on learning, and about ten percent, and it's not uh, cast in stone. Uh, if it's 8%, that's fine too. Um, um, if you have, uh, uh, it, it's just that it has enough material, enough variety of material to check whether the model works. So if you have a document, uh, if you have 45 pages of ground truth, so you only work with ground truth because the rest isn't really as useful to train the model. So ground truth really trains the, the model. If you have uh, 45 pages, then uh, you would probably do about, uh, well, I would say uh, 42 in the, um, in the training set and three in the validation. Could be 40 uh, to five, something around that measure. And then um, the computer has enough variety to check on. So you do need to select these by yourself and you also need to keep in mind that, that the computer needs to see a bit of a variety uh, in documents. So um, then there's this very important uh, option which is base model. If you click on that you go again to the uh, option of all the models and you can choose a base model. What does a base model do? Let's assume that I'm working, uh, well, that's not really assumed, that's uh, very likely. When I'm working on a 17th century Dutch text and I'm using uh, the, uh, the model of Dutch mountains, which is uh, basically 18th century, then much of the, um, the knowledge on the language is already within that uh, Dutch mountain model. So what I'm then doing is basically adjust the model to my script. So that's where you use base model. And it also helps to uh, improve your own model and it boosts it. So it's, um, it's, it learns quicker than when you start from scratch. So that's where you click base model. So if you're working on um, early modern German text, then you might want to use uh, one of the uh, the models from uh, Tobias Heudel, uh, who did some early modern um, German uh, models, or if you're working on um, Dutch Frisian text, which hasn't got a model available yet, you can still use a base model um, to 
quicker, uh, quicken uh, the, the process of learning it. So here I'm going to the, um, to the models. And I want to show you another option besides from using a base model. And that's using the original data that was uh, used for a specific model. And you can, here you have a Neo-Latin uh, um, model, uh, which might be useful if you're working on Italian sources. You can then click and add the, uh, the training data. So you can either choose it to use it as a base model, as a booster, or you can use the knowledge uh, and the full transcriptions by just adding it. And then it will be used within, um, within your model. So if you have a mixed, model, uh, mixed text, so your texts are Italian and Latin, you might want to add some Latin uh, pages to your model and you can use that from uh, one of these available models. So you can use the training set from these models by going here. Normally you see the document. So here you can select your document, but you can also use the HDR model data to uh, work on your, um, on your own model. So, um, so as I just showed you, you can use that HDR model data as well. Um, if you use a base model, then uh, it basically fixes the uh, knowledge it has in the server and um, use that to improve the uh, model. Um, a base model makes your uh, uh, makes a new model more quickly. Um, but you, you won't be very much aware of the total number of words and lines that is uh, um, available. Um, or you could just add all the additional training material from, uh, from colleagues who have made it available. Um, let's see. Um, I, uh, I would use a base model over the underlying data because it's, uh, it's much quicker and you will have your model available within like two hours. And if you run a new model using uh, the data from uh, the, all of the underlying data from, let's say, uh, a, man, a, a model such as Dutch Mountains, it can take you up to uh, six days before you have a model available. And it may not even be much better. So um, using a base model basically adjusts a model to your specific handwriting. And that's most of the time uh, what you're looking for. So you can't change any of these fixed models that are available. So if you've created a model, you can't change it. It's basically uh, fixed, but you can work again with the data or you can create a new model. So um, if you are working with, um, uh, let's say um, 18th century court records in uh, Belgium and you want to um, um, adjust the Dutch mountain model, you can uh, create your own ground truth for your 18th century court records and then um, use the Dutch mountains um, base model and create your own model. But you can't change the Dutch mountain model. Let's see. Um, I think we covered that. Um, then we go to exporting files. When you have done all that hard work and you might want to put it on your website as being an archive or um, um, you might want to put it as an attachment to a colleague uh, who isn't really keen on working with transcribers but would like to read your document, then you need to go and export your file. So again, here on the top, you have to go to export and you go to the, out, the right facing arrow. And then this menu pops up and you can export for your current document or for the whole collection. And you can choose whatever kind of uh, file you fancy. 
So the PDF, you can choose whether you want to have the, uh, the image with the text as an underlying uh, layer. So you basically get searchable pictures. Um, you can export the auto uh, uh, data, which has the coordinates or the match, uh, data, uh, match files may have the underlying coordinates. Uh, I, I always confuse the two, sorry. Um, you can also export without the image if you have copyright issues, for, uh, issues for, uh, um, for instance. You can export as TEI, which might be interesting if you're making a scholarly edition. You may need to change um, the TEI, but it is still uh, a very useful option if you want to put it online, for instance. Obviously, you can export as a, uh, as a Word document or as a simple TXT. Um, if you want to, uh, depending on your needs, you can, uh, you can choose. So you, um, you then hit uh, um, OK, and then nothing happens. Why not? Because you have to wait till the server is ready to wrap it up nicely in some sort of a zip file. So it compresses it and then you get a link in your mailbox and you can click on the link you can download it and extract it in your uh, on your computer and you can use whatever you need so that's basically how you export a file any questions so far so then we go to um, searching and uh, as mentioned before, we have uh, keyword spotting, but we also have full text uh, searches. And for that, we go back to the toolbar and we have the, uh, the binoculars here. And that's number 10, as we have seen before, or my number 10. And if you go to full text search, which is called Solar, um, and I'm searching a document for a specific last name. This document shows up 10, uh, sorry, six uh, different options where it found the name. So it literally searches for these uh, names. Um, and then um, if I were to do, uh, I can also do fuzzy search. So it will look for potential other options but it will stay very close to these options and it does only do it uh, character based. So um, then you have the option of going for keyword spotting and um, there are several examples and I would warmly invite you to uh, have a look at these, uh, one from Amsterdam, one from Finland and one from uh, the UK, so whatever you like. Um, these, uh, this is um, a technology based on finding words in images. Uh, it's mainly based on the image itself, so it's pixel based. And even if your uh, model um, would have about a 30% character error rate, it would still function. So you would be able to spot like names within a text if you're interested in uh, uh, genealogy. Um, and the depiction will be on a uh, confidence value and it will always show something. So what does it do? Here you have uh, a little bit of information on how a computer works. Um, you see these, um, these dots and the computer is learning uh, where dots need to be to be a certain character. And it makes a calculation. If a dot is at a certain spot, then it's likely uh, going to be a U. Um, if it's not, then it might be an L. And based on these probabilities, it can figure out, um, it can show you various options. So 99 times uh, of 99% of the times it will be a U. But if you are not requesting a U, but uh, are uh, uh, looking for an L now, well, maybe this U could be an L and it will show you um, the chances. So I'm not a computer expert, but the computer calculates how likely it is that a character can be A or B, um, etc. So if you go to keyword spotting and I search the same document for the same name, 
And then I hit search and it completed, it found ele uh, 13 options. If you click on create it and it gives you all of the options. So you can then uh, see how confident the computer is that a certain word um, or certain uh, bit would resemble the word I'm looking for. And you can each uh, individually look th them up. You can't change, uh, you can't change them uh, all in one, but, you, but if you are uh, convinced that here it's not I, but would have to be OIR, then you could click on it, go to that specific page and change your transcription uh, if necessary. Yes. Is there something like um, PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> yeah? Okay, perfect. So thanks, Animeke, for inviting me to speak in your webinar. I'm sorry for not having a camera here. It was left behind in the office during Corona rush. <laughs> yeah, well, I may tell you a little bit about the Read Co-op, this thing behind the Transcribes platform and we'll try to keep it nice and short. On the slide we have got a little overview of what I will be talking about. So first of all some general information about the co-op, the pricing model, how to become a member, the Transcribers user conference, public models and our planned crowdsourcing project for modern handwritings. As Animeke already mentioned, the uh, Read Co op was founded after the Read project ended in summer last year. After the ending of this project, we were searching for a suitable institution to further sustain and develop the Transcribes platform. And the Read Co op was basically the thing which came out. So, just a few small facts about the Read project. REIT stands for Recognition and Enrichment of Archival Documents. It was financed by the European Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program with 8.2 million euros. And the main target of this project was to extend access to archival material. And this should be achieved by the development and promotion of handwritten text recognition. The Read Co-op is a European cooperative society which was established in July 2019 with a headquarter in Innsbruck. The Co-op is based on the EU directives for European cooperative societies, but also people and institutions from non-EU states can become members. The current status is that we have more than 50 members. Um, the list with all the members can be checked out on our homepage. On the slide, I have a small extract of some institutions and persons who are already taking part. We have, for example, the University of, of Greifswald, the State Archives Zurich, the National Archives of Finland and the Technical University Valencia and so on. Um, on 29th of May, they will meet the first time with the board in the first um, general meeting. So they're still at the, at the beginning with all that. The structure of the co-op is quite simple. So there are two official parties who can make decisions. This is on the one hand, the board of directors, which includes Günther Mühlberger, Andi Stauder and Melissa Terras. And they are responsible for the operative business. And on the other hand, the second party is the general assembly, which includes the co-op members. The General Assembly is responsible for the strategic planning and one member can have one to five 
roads, which can be purchased. Um, but this is the maximum number. And the number of votes depends on how many shares one has purchased. So 5,000 euros is the maximum value of shares which one member can have. With that limitation, the democratic structure of the co-op should be given a priori. And then depending on the weight of decisions, a simple or two thirds majority is needed. The key issue of the co-op is to operate community oriented. So with a user request as a main focus, like in an association. The com common interest in this case is to extend access to historical documents and that should be achieved with digitization and handwritten text recognition. That the members need to be supported is also agreed by contract. And to achieve this, the co-op is allowed to do business. So this is the main difference to an association here. The profit though will be reinvested in the co-op and is not meant for anybody's personal interest, but for the improvement of services. Then there is of course the question what it will cost to become a member and to use the services of transcribers. I must start by saying that we are still in the final phase of the discussions about the pricing model and a few details still need to be adapted. Um, the finalization is planned for this summer. But the, um, how to say, the general functionality is that there will be different packages of a certain number of pages which can be purchased. For a private person with only a small amount of data, um, they will have the opportunity to already get started with a small amount of money. And for those who have a yearly subscription, there, there will be um, additional discount of, let's say, 10% pages in addition. And then again, for co-op members, there will be, again, additional um, discount. So you can either have the, the normal price if you get a yearly subscription, you have an additional discount. And if you additionally have the co-op membership, you get again additional discount. And with all that, you are about um, minus 25% of the normal price. In general, I can say that the prices per page will be between 14 and 20 cents, depending on how much discount you have. The plan is that for packages for a few thousand pages, it will be possible to buy them via our homepage. For a bigger project, we will be in touch personally in any case, so to discuss a, an individual offer. And then for teachers and students, there will be free con contingents. For example, if a student uses transcribers for his master's thesis or if transcribers is taught in a lecture or if somebody gives workshops. So you don't have to worry here. How to become a member? The accession is a formal act. So the chair of the institution who wants to become a member needs to sign. Legally, the accession is rather unproblematic. So we have made the experience with institutions which are co-op members already by now. Um, they had their lawyers check the accession to the co-op and until now we didn't have any objections regarding that. If an institution is a co-op member, the discounts applies to all the projects of this institution, of course. Um, regarding the prices for membership, the minimum is one share for a private person. Um, this is 250 euros. <clears throat> for institutions, the minimum is four shares. Um, 
and that's 1,000 euros then. The yearly membership fee um, comes in addition and is to 25% um, of the shares. So again, the minimum for a private person would be 63 euros and for institutions, 250 euros. Um, which benefits do you get um, if you have got a code membership? First of all, getting discounts, co-determination in the General Assembly, full refund of the share price if you decide to leave the co-op at some point of time, and then discounts for our Transcribers User Conference. This conference takes place once a year, and the last one we had on 6th and 7th of February this year in Innsbruck. On the slide, you can see the about 160 participants we had. On the program, there have been various presentations and workshops. And there, we have been happy about that there also was a lot of exchange between participants. So seemingly kind of fruitful for everybody. Regarding the workshops, we had topics like how to work on medieval texts in transcribers, how to text to image, structure rec recognition, or training of big models. And then there have been various presentations, for example, about new features of transcribers, and then a few projects talking about their work with transcribers and a report on our user survey. Another thing I would like to mention shortly, and Animieke has already did so as well, these are the public models. Um, so as already said, they are trained by transcribers users and are made av available for all the other ones. I have got um, a little extract on the slide of the overview document. So you can see um, not all of the public models, but um, a good number of them, let's say, to get a little overview how, um, which languages are covered. So you can find this document on our wiki page with a link on the slide. And there is also a little description and extract of the handwriting, as, at least if it is, if the training data is public as well. Mm, yeah, public models um, are a good choice to have a first transcription, which can be the basis for your own training data. So if the model suits well to your document, um, you can correct the transcription and then use it as training data or use the public model as a base model for your own one, which also can be helpful, especially also to reduce the amount of um, transcription you have to do by hand. So with a base model, it gets less. And last but not least, um, I would like to inform you that we are currently planning a project with the goal to train a big model for the recognition of modern handwriting. This should be achieved through crowdsourcing with the transcribers uses. And we have thought of the following workflow. So first one writes one page by hand, a text about anything you like. Then the DocScan app is used to take a photo of this. This photo is uploaded to the trans to transcribers via the app. Um, there, a manual transcription by the individual user needs to be done. And then the document is submi submitted via transcribers. 
then there will be a certain deadline. And finally, the, the transcribers team will start to train the model. And in the end, we will hopefully have a stable model to recognize modern handwriting. Yeah, that was already it from my side. And if you have any questions, I will happily try to answer them. Let's just see if there are um, more questions also uh, on the rest of um, uh, what we have been talking about today. Um, let's see if I can share. I also share you a, lo a lot of links. Um, um, so we will be dealing with all of the questions that are remaining in a, in a few minutes. Um, I want to stress, uh, these are also the links that Joanna just showed you, just a couple of additions. There's a Facebook group uh, called Transcribers Users and it's mainly run by uh, users. <laughs> um, if you have questions, you can just post them there and, uh, oh yes, I still need to show my camera. Um, uh, and um, you can ask them there and since there are people from all over the world, um, you likely get an answer quite, uh, quite quickly. Um, so there are many advanced users there as well and some people from the re team. Um, so here are a couple of links and uh, they might be useful. Um, there are, uh, I have written down a couple of uh, questions that have been asked so far and weren't answered yet. And please, Joanna, uh, um, add where, uh, wherever you can add. Um, uh, there is a question about um, uh, do we need a model before we can begin in automatic transcription? Um, what's the best approach to transcribe at least 100 pages and then uh, the email, the request. Well, you can, um, you don't necessarily need a model to uh, uh, create, uh, to, to start. Um, um, but that would mean that you would have to uh, start transcribing from scratch. But you can try to find a model that is as close as possible to your language. So if you're dealing with uh, late 18th century texts uh, in English, then you might try the Bentham uh, model and adjust the, the text to your needs. Um, it's always, uh, most of the time, it's easier to correct the text than to start from scratch. Um, then someone wants to know how you share a model from a um, um, from a collection to another, and that's if you go in the collection and you click on models, you do a right click and then you see share model, and you click go to add to collection, and you select your private collection, for instance, and you click on OK, and then it's shared to your private collection. Um, we have someone asking about tagging. Tagging can be done in two ways, uh, but it will be dealt with more in, a, uh, in detail in the advanced workshop. You can do a right click, go to tags, and say that this is, uh, let's say, Italian. In this case, I selected the whole line. Or you can go to meta uh, metadata and you go to uh, textual and let's say I'm just coming up with a, a, a suggestion here which is entirely uh, wrong obviously uh, and you can um, uh, add it here and let's see um, I haven't done this in a while um, you can, oops, you can customize here uh, and you can add properties and you can create tags over here. So just, uh, just give it a try around here, but the easiest is right click and then add a tag uh, up here. 
If you want to do structural text, which has to do with the layout, then you go to structural and you say that a certain uh, line region is a uh, paragraph, for instance. Okay. Um, how to resave uh, or how to save uh, whatever you've been doing. If you leave your document, you will always get a pop up whether you want to save your transcription or you can just uh, uh, click on the, uh, on, the, on the disk. Joanna, I think there is a question on the pricing of the services. Have you seen it? Oh, uh, I think that question was sent to me directly. So I'm sending it to you, Joanna. Um, here you go. And I, I think I'm going to unmute everyone. Don't start uh, talking all uh, at the same time, but uh, it might be more convenient if you can um ask your uh, question um uh, you can unmute yourself now um if you want to ask a question be aware it will be recorded at the moment but if you have a question please uh, go ahead okay about the pricing for the sports club project yeah unfortunately i'm not able to give um detailed prices yet but if you send us an email to info at readcope Dot eu we can have a look and already send you a cost estimate so this is in any case possible and most probably there will be for everybody a free starter contingent um, so i don't know how many pages you planning to process but yeah i would reckon at least 250 should be free in the beginning. I don't know if that is useful for you or if it is too little, but in any case, you can always send us an email and we can, can have a look so you have an estimation at least. There's a challenge whether uh, it's possible to self-host a document or transcribe a server. Hmm. <laughs> be be aware that Innsbruck has a lot of H, uh, HPCs there running a uh, transcriber, so it's not like you can run it on your laptop. Yeah, it is possible partly, but not every job can be extracted from transcribers to a known server. I think, yeah. So, for example, the, the HDR, I think, the HDR itself is something which can't be done on a server outside of the read co op ones. Any more questions? You can ask it orally if you unmute yourself. Um, obviously, we entirely understand if you have to go elsewhere and uh, you will get a link where you can review this uh, entire uh, webinar as well as where you can find the slide etc um there's a question on multilingual documents um well it's possible to select uh text regions and then uh just have these be run by a uh, specific model so you don't have to run uh so you could select uh i can actually show you that's probably best um here we go. If I um, need, oops, I need to go to a different selection in my case to make it a little bit more clearly. Um, um, oops, I need to select a certain document and probably not the right one I'm now clicking on. This is actually a French document I worked on. Um, if I uh, want to run a model, I can restrict on structure text. So if I only want, if you are very careful in uh, 
creating your um, text regions and you would uh, call one of them paragraph French and the other one paragraph in English, then you could actually select here paragraph in English and then run an English model on it. And if you want to do a, uh, uh, the paragraphs in French, then you could click that one and you would run the model only on that specific um, uh, selection. So that would be a solution for multilingual documents. You could also just add so much more data uh, to your model so that uh, um, it would know both uh, languages and then work on uh, work on that way. Um, I haven't scheduled the advanced workshop yet, but I'm planning to do that somewhere end of next month, maybe early June. So more questions. You can unmute yourself and ask it orally, or if you prefer, you can just write it down and ask it. There are already quite a few people interested in the uh, advanced workshop. I really hope this kind of helped you to get uh, around with the basics for transcribers. I know it will be still a bit of work to get it uh, working for you, but uh, um, yeah, at least you know where to find the buttons and in which order to handle things. You might also find it interesting to know that if you want to uh, move a text to the next uh, line, you could do control enter and you can then um, move it to the next line. If you want to move something back, the, the line should be empty and you could do delete. One question I have seen about the train button for this simply send us an email to info at and we will enable your account for it. So the standard context. <laughs> and thank you all for attending. Thank you. <laughs>